we're seeing the the calling out of the nation of Israel and how Peter shows them, tells them that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, then presents to them that the one they crucified, Jesus of Nazareth, whom God raised from the dead, that's the name they need to call on. And they can call on him because he then takes the time to give evidence from Scripture and and by their own witness and the witness of the Holy Spirit that's now in their midst uh, that, that Jesus Christ has indeed risen from the dead. And uh, he kind of concludes that in verse 36 where it says, Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the way that when he, when he says both Lord and Christ is that in the exaltation of Jesus Christ, raised and exalted to the Father's right hand, that now the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer going to be the suffering uh, Messiah any longer. He is now Lord and Christ. Lord in the sense that the day of the Lord is going to break out and he's going to come and take possession of this world. He's going to come back and judge. He's at the Father's right hand until his enemies are made his footstool, back up in verse 32 and 33. And, uh, and so he's going to, that's, and that's the sense in which he's Lord. And Christ in the sense that he can save those who call upon him. And so there, you're going to meet him. He's Lord and Christ both uh, for everybody, but you're going to meet him one way or the other as Lord or as Christ. And, and so when they realize that they have rejected the one who God has sent to them, the one uh, who the prophets said would come, the one they crucified, it says in verse 37, when they heard these things, heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So at this point, all the way from verse 37 down to verse 40, uh, Peter's going to answer the question that they asked him, what shall we do? Now, there's a couple things just to say before we answer that question, and that's a real important question, and it's a real important section to study together and to know what this verse says, why it says it, who it says it to. Uh, so we're going to look at, at verse 38 quite closely. But uh, something that I said uh, in that when we met together uh, last time when it was not uh, being taped and all is back up in verse 30. Uh, it says, it was going through the witness of, of the scripture where David made a prophecy that did not, was not fulfilled with David, but could only be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that is that David's flesh saw corruption, but he prophesied that his soul would not be left in hell, neither would the Holy One's flesh see corruption. And the Holy One is a reference to Jesus Christ. And because he rose the third day, his flesh saw no corruption. And so David, way back 600 years before Christ, made a prophecy that Jesus Christ would be raised the third day from the dead. And, and the, based on that, verse 30 says, Therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn of, with an oath unto, uh, to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. And, and, and there's a point made by some people who do not recognize, uh, they actually take a, make a formula out of verse 30, and do not recognize the dispensation of grace, and that what God has promised to David and to the nation of Israel is yet future. And that is that Jesus Christ sitting on David's throne is not something that has taken place yet. There's a whole group of people, in fact, there's several major denominations that believe that uh, Jesus Christ is already on the throne, that the kingdom is here, and we live in what they would call the millennium. Uh, the Bible calls it, you know, the thousand-year reign of Christ, so you get the term millennium. But they take a thousand mean eternity, and they say that Jesus Christ already is reigning, and their proof text for that is verse 30. Because they said that God swore, according to the flesh, at the end of that verse, that he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. David made a prophecy that God would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. And so their formula is this, if God raised up Christ, then he must be on David's throne. Because he raised up Christ to sit on his throne, and if Christ is raised, then he's already on the throne of David. And if he's already on the throne of David, then we're already in the kingdom, and uh, the kingdom is here. And like I say, when you, anybody who's amillennial, who do not, does not take the thousand-year reign of Christ, when you read the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, he comes back, and then 
Revelation 20, he raises the people from the dead and puts the devil in the bottomless pit for a thousand years and he reigns for a thousand years and then after the thousand years are finished there's one more battle where the uh, enemy that comes against him is destroyed and then eternity future begins. We are called premillennial because we believe Christ comes back and literally, literally reigns a thousand years. When he returns, that's when he'll sit on the throne of David. When you read Revelation, in fact, hold your place here because I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this, but just so you have a proof verse. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus Christ is not on David's throne. In the context, he's sitting at the Father's right hand, and according to the Lord Jesus Christ's words in Revelation chapter 3, it says in verse 21, it says, to him that overcometh, Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father, where? In his throne. When Jesus Christ comes back and sits on what Revelation, or what Matthew 25, Revelation, uh, no, Matthew chapter 19, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back in the second coming and sit on the throne of his glory. His throne and His glory will be established on this earth in the second coming. And He's promising here that those who overcome, that's those who go through the, 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 the last days of the book of Revelation, the 70th week of Daniel there, and they overcome the Antichrist, that He's promising that when He comes back and sits on His throne, they'll sit on thrones with Him. Just like He overcame and is now sitting down at the Father's, on the th Father's throne. Jesus Christ is not on the throne of David. According to his words, he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father, which is the Father's throne. He's not his throne. His throne, well, when he comes back, he's going to sit on the throne of David, and that's going to be his throne as the seed of David. And, and that'll be in the second coming. David, like to say, there's two problems here. <laughs> to say that he is, because he's risen from the dead, that he's sitting on, the, on David's throne right now, would make... David's throne, the right hand of the Father. And if that's David's throne, did David ever sit at the right hand of the Father? No, David sat on a throne in Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's, why it's, that, that's where David's throne's at. And when Christ comes back, that's where, David, that's where the Lord Jesus Christ will reign on his throne, the throne of David. Right now, he's reigning with the Father at the Father's right hand on his, at his throne. Now, back in Acts 2... It's funny how people make up a formula and sound like they're really smart, but it's really, it's really ignorant. It doesn't say that God raised up Christ and he's sitting on his throne. It says he raised up Christ to sit on his throne. You know, if I, if I, if, you know we know from Matthew nineteen twenty eight that the Lord Jesus Christ says when he comes back, the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it is true that Peter was called by Jesus Christ to sit on one of the 12 thrones, right? Well, wasn't Peter already called? So is he sitting on one of the 12 thrones? No. <laughs> He's called, and eventually this is going to be the result of his calling. Not that since you were called, then this is the fact of where you are now. Just like, and I hesitate to say this because I don't like when some people do this, I... I have been saved, you have been saved, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, I'm going to ask you, are you seated with Christ in heavenly places? Yes. <laughs> this is why I hate to ask the question. <laughs> and the, you can go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. But when it says that, it's talking about positionally, we have a place with Christ in heaven. Right. Are you there? Are you sitting in heavenly places? No. no, the rapture still has to take place before you're actually going to be in heaven. So just because you're saved doesn't mean you're in heaven. But I argue, some people argue, oh, I'm already there. I'm already in heaven. <laughs> As if all this is make-believe and not real. No, you're saved for that reason. But just because you're saved now doesn't mean you're already there. Positionally, you have a place guaranteed for you there. You're in Christ, and Christ is there in heavenly places. But someday you're actually going to be in the heavenly places. Uh, I has, I, that's why I made that the second illustration. Anyhow, when it says in that verse 30 that God raised up Christ to sit on his throne, 
That's the first step. Raising up Christ is the first step toward having Jesus Christ sit on the throne, uh, on his own throne, the throne of David. The first step is resurrection. The second step is uh, destroying his enemy. The third step is returning back to earth. And then finally, the goal will be established where Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of his glory. And so one doesn't mean that when they say this equals that, that's, that's not even logical. That's not even what the words mean. So... So all this belief that Jesus Christ is already on the throne and that the throne is not real, the throne is really spiritual, and the throne is Jesus Christ reigning in your heart, and, and all of that is just spiritualizing the promises of God's Word and, and just making none of the words of Scripture being literal and, uh, and real. It's all just kind of a make-believe. and Anyhow, that, that, that's what they do with that. And I, I, we went past those verses without me saying that to you. Let's pick up in verse 36. When he says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, I just want to share this with you because it came up today. Clifton Hawkins calls me quite often, as you know, and, and one of the things he likes me to do is to do on my quick verse in my computer, he always is counting words and wants to know how many times something is said. Interestingly, he, he called me today and he asked, how many times is the house of Israel talked about? And 152 times, I just quickly gave him the answer. And I'm looking at that and I go, wow, that's amazing. Because it's only six times in the New Testament. And this is why he asked these questions, because sometimes it does share some light. Two times in the book of Acts. Acts 2.26, right here, 36, where we're looking at. And again in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen's addressing the nation of Israel. He'll call him the house of Israel. Then, the, the, uh, actually, the first two times is Matthew chapter 10. And you're probably familiar with that, where they got to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom and go not unto the Gentiles, but only to the house of Israel. Matthew 15 is the other one, where he tells the, the Gentile lady that uh, when he won't respond to healing her daughter, he said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So you got Matthew twice, Acts twice, and then it shows up in Hebrews, I think, 10 twice. And it just jumps right over Paul's epistles which is real clear because Paul's epistles are not about the house of Israel. Matthew is about the house of Israel. Early part of the book of Acts, it's about the house of Israel. The book of Hebrews is about the house of Israel. That's why it's called Hebrews. But Paul's epistles are written to us Gentiles, and naturally the house of Israel is not even mentioned there. Just, just one of those curious things. It just so happened that we were looking at verse 36, so I thought I'd share that with you. But anyhow, it's let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Over in verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 30, uh, 23, when he reminded them that Jesus of Nazareth was rejected by them, he said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now Peter's t- addressing the nation of Israel and he says, You took him and by wicked hands crucified and slain him. Then he says, God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Well, if you believe the things that Peter has just said, that the one you rejected, the one who was crucified, that God raised from the dead, now he's Lord in Christ, you're going to be, you're going to be in terror at this point, realizing your failure. And that's why in verse 37, they're pricked in their heart. It says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is an extremely important question. Because if you've crucified, especially by wicked hands, crucified and slain him, and he's Lord and Christ, he's going to come back and judge, what can you do? And and Peter's got a remedy to them. But before we get into the remedy, their conviction here, they're convicted in their heart. Now, there's something real basic that that I hope that you'll learn and never let someone take it from you. It is, when they're pricked in their heart, the way that God works, the way the Holy Spirit works in convicting people's heart is through preaching. A lot of times people talk about, oh, I, I was convicted, or God, the Holy Spirit convicted me, and they start talking about, you know, terrors that they experience and different things, as if nothing ever happened... Like, God just all of a sudden started working on your heart. And my heart's... How does God prick a heart? How does that happen? In fact, uh, look back with me to John chapter 16. Because this is where God said that this was going to take place. That these things are going to take place by the Spirit of God. John 16, 
John chapter 16, it says in verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. So Jesus Christ says, I'm going to go away, and it's expedient. It's, it's profitable for you that I go away, because the Holy Spirit's going to come. And verse 8 says, and when, he, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Now, just think of that. Sin, because they believe not on me. They crucified him, right? Mm-hmm. Now they're going to be convicted of that sin. Of righteousness. Well, they're not righteous, are they? And they're going to meet him as Lord. So he's going to come back and judge them. Verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Satan is going to fall, and anybody associated with him, they're going to, they're going to fall under his judgment. Now, when it says, when, when he, verse 8... When he uh, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and unrighteousness and of judgment. How is the Holy Spirit going to do that? Just people walking down the street are going to have all these convictions? Well, we're seeing it done. Peter is preaching to the nation of Israel. The Holy Spirit has come. They see them speaking in tongues. They see these things going on. They say, what does this mean? Peter tells them what it means. It means that you killed Christ. God raised from the dead. He's sitting at the Father's right hand. He's poured out the Holy Spirit, and you're witness to that. And you crucified him and slain him. And when they said, what shall we do? Their, Their heart is pricked because of the preaching of Peter. That's how God brings people under conviction. That's how the Holy Spirit brings people under conviction, through the Holy Spirit in a believer preaching the Word of God and telling people what God's Word said, that's what brings people under conviction. People don't get under conviction just sitting there watching television, all of a sudden they're under conviction. Conviction is how the Holy Spirit uses preachers and God's Word to penetrate the heart of a lost person. And now the lost person with their heart pricked, now they're a little bit sensitive. If their heart was calloused and you've got someone pricking your heart, even the most callous heart at this point is under conviction, is, is now open to making a decision. And the decision is still theirs to make. So anyhow, when, you, when you're over here in Acts chapter 2, that's what's happening there in verse 37. When they heard this, when they heard Peter's preaching about their rejection of Christ, who God raised from the dead, who's now Lord in Christ, they're pricked in their heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles. Now, that's an important part of that verse. It's Peter and the eleven that stood up and preached this message. Their question about what they should do is to Peter and the apostles, and the they in that verse is verse is when it says in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Who's they? Well, verse 36, it's the house of Israel. It's the nation of Israel now turning to Peter and the twelve apostles, asking what they, the nation of Israel, needs to do. So when you get to verse 38. Guess who that's an answer for? Yeah, it's re- you, no one ever studies the Bible this way. We, by the way, we, one of the reasons that we're so busy, I don't know what it was, but it was the 9 o'clock, it's program 52. I almost have to review it again of, of, our, of the Forgotten Truths. I bet you I sold a dozen of those programs in the last two days. People call up and say, I want that program where he shows the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. Well, I kind of laugh because what, <laughs> when do we ever preach and we don't do that? <laughs> Especially Pastor Jordan. I want that where he puts the chart up. <laughs> you know, when does he not put a chart up, you know? But, so I ask him what time they saw the program, what date, and I know which one. But I, I've had at least 12 people call in the, just in the last three days. Been three, yeah. <laughs> three days asking for that because all of a sudden it dawns on them that there, there's a different message to the nation of Israel than there is to us Gentiles today. Now, uh, we didn't get into it yet, the importance of that, but what I'm saying is in verse 37, it's important for you to know who's asking the question and who they're asking the question to, even before we're going to find out what the answer is. And and for you, now, now take it more practical, for you to get the right answer to that question, that when they say, what shall we do, they're actually asking, what shall I do to be saved, right? Because they're in, they're in big trouble. They crucified God's Son. For you to get the right answer to your question, what you need to do to be saved, 
you've got to write, ask the right apostle, don't you? See, they're not asking the apostle Paul. If they asked Saul of Tarsus, he would tell them something different because he's, he's one of the lost Jews at this point. This is the, the nation of Israel turning to their apostle to ask what they ought to do because their apostle is going to tell them apostles once sent by God with a message. Jesus Christ has sent the 12 apostles with a message to the nation of Israel. Hold your place here, Galatians chapter 2. Some of you don't need to turn there because it's probably wore out in your Bible. But some people have not seen these verses, and the ones who have seen it have not acknowledged the truth that's in these verses, and as a result of that, can't tell you how to be saved today. Or if they do tell you, it'll be so mixed up that you wouldn't know how to get saved when they're done telling you. Galatians chapter 2, look at this. Now, I threw out the Paul. You're not, we're not going to see the Apostle Paul show up on the scene here until Acts chapter 9. But Romans to Philemon in your Bible, the book of Galatians being one of those, is the Apostle Paul writing about what God sent him out to preach and to who he sent him to preach it to. Now, he goes to Jerusalem to communicate what he's preaching to the Gentiles. Verse chapter, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, Paul's writing this, and chapter 1, verse 1 will tell you that. But 14 years after, that's after his conversion, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. Now just understand, Paul went to Jerusalem to explain, even to the 12 apostles, what he's preaching to Gentiles. They don't know what he's preaching. In fact, they're questioning what he's preaching to Gentiles. Verse 7 says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. You see two different gospels there? Amen. When Paul went to the Gentiles, he carried a message that's actually called the gospel of the uncircumcision. Because what Peter was preaching is called the gospel of the circumcision. Now, the circumcision is a reference to the, the promise that God made to the nation of Israel, what God's going to accomplish through the nation of Israel. That's the good news that's going to come to this world through Israel. The gospel of the uncircumcision is good news coming to this world apart from Israel. Uncircumcision. Now, not only is there two different gospels in that verse, verse 8, it says, For he that wrought effectual in Peter, that is, God working in spiritually in Peter, powerfully in Peter. For he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, see Cephas, that's one of Peter's names, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the heathen, that's the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. So Peter is an apostle to the nation of Israel with their gospel message, right? And Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles with our gospel message. If you want to know how to be saved, and you want the right answer, you better ask the right apostle to you. Now, what's happening in Acts chapter 2, in verse 37, is proper. The Jews, the circumcision are asking Peter, their apostle, what they should do. And Peter's got the answer for them. He knows what they need to do. And, and so they're asking the right apostle the right question. That's what verse 37 is about. And, and so the answer comes to them in verse 38. It says, Then Peter, and, uh, Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, we have to look at that verse real clear, and we have to tear apart the verse, even to understand exactly why Peter is saying this to the nation of Israel. But we have to tear apart that verse because if someone came to you, if you ask someone today how to be saved, if you realize that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ is coming back in judgment or in salvation, you're going to meet him one way or the other, and you want to be saved, and you ask someone how to be saved, and they tell you, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, you will end up dying and going to hell. That is not the gospel message for today. 
when, when they, the, it's the nation of Israel, the house of Israel who crucified Christ and rejected him, when they asked Peter for them, the answer Peter gave is to them, it's their answer. It's what they needed to do to be, have their sins remitted them. And, and so we need to look real close at this verse and understand why Peter's saying that to them, and then at the same time realize why it is that we've got to go to our apostle about our message. Now, there's something here right at the beginning that, that will prepare you for the right answer. And that is, when he says in this verse, repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. Now, he says a lot of other things. We'll just take that phrase, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. The answer that Peter gave tells us two important things. Hold your place here. Come to Mark chapter 1. Now Mark chapter 1... I, I, it depends how familiar you are with, with the New Testament as it begins. Um, I pick this one because it just starts out clearly with John's ministry. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And John, that's John the Baptist, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. When, Peter, when, when they asked, the Jews asked Peter, realizing they crucified their Messiah... And said, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. We're just taking the short statement there. That's the identical message of John the Baptist. That's what John the Baptist, the whole New Testament began with. The showing up of John the Baptist. Calling the nation of Israel to his baptism. But his baptism is called the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He's calling the nation of Israel to repent. And, and, and therefore, what we learn is that when Peter preaches baptism for the remission of sins, that he's back there preaching John's message. He's going back to the very thing that during the ministry, John the Baptist came introducing Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel and calling the nation to repentance, preparing them for their king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Did they receive their king? No, they rejected their king. So now that the king's been rejected and God raised from the dead and he's back to the father, but he's going to come back again in judgment and become their king, now they're saying, what shall we do? And Peter says the same thing, John the Baptist. What you immediately know is that early acts is a renewed opportunity for the nation of Israel who failed under John's preaching to still be a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. There's still forgiveness for that nation. There's still an opportunity for the nation of Israel to trust Jesus Christ as the rightful king of Israel and to be a part of that kingdom. God's given them another chance. That's what the early part of the book of Acts is. That's why Peter's message matched John's message. He's calling out a believing remnant within the nation of Israel. Remember, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus Christ is that name that they need to call upon. And when they realize they crucified him, now they still have another chance to call on him. So it's a renewed opportunity for the nation of Israel to be saved. And and the believing remnant is the one who's going to be saved. John the Baptist, don't lose your place in Mark, but you're right close to it. So go to Matthew chapter 3. I just want to remind you two things about John's ministry. Matthew chapter 3, here's John come showing up, and it says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. The kingdom of heaven is God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came as the seed of David, And he's going to sit on the throne of David, the kingdom of heaven. Heaven's reign is going to be established on the earth. And and by the way, we'll show you in a second how that's called good news. At hand means it's not far away. So if the nation of Israel is out of the way with God, and what you've learned in the Old Testament is that God is always going to divide within the nation of Israel the people that have the, the repentant, the contrite heart from those that are wayward, they're going to be cut off then if you're wayward, then you better get right real fast. 
And John's baptism is called the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. It's the calling out of who is going to repent for, within the nation of Israel so that they can be part of that kingdom because, look down in verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Down lower he's going to say the axe is laid at the root of the trees. And, it, and, and every... Uh, well, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly pur purge his floor. He'll gather the wheat into the garner. So the wheat, that's the good. They're, they're going to go in. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There's a division going on with the, within the nation of Israel. The repentant nation are going to go into the kingdom. The unrepentant part of that nation of Israel is going to be judged with eternal fire, cast into the lake of fire. They're going to hell. So there's a division there, and the Pharisees, John says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, as well, look over in Matthew uh, chapter 4, in verse 17, after John is thrown in prison, this is when Jesus Christ's public ministry began. It says, from that time, verse 17, Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. So he's saying the same thing that John the Baptist is saying, right? The kingdom of heaven's at hand. Now look at verse 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching, what does it say? The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. See, in his kingdom there's not going to be any sickness. So to verify that his message is true, he's healing, showing that the kingdom of heaven is indeed at hand. But when it says in Matthew 7, uh, 4, 17, it calls it, he's preaching, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. In verse 23, it's called the gospel of the kingdom. The good news about the kingdom was it's at hand. It's near to come. The king is here. Well, they killed the king. Now, in Acts, there's a new opportunity for the nation of Israel to believe their king, to receive their king, and they're ca being called back to repentance, just like John the Baptist called them to repentance. He preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's exactly what Peter's preaching. So, the first, the two things that you learn, first of all, I got them written different in my notes, but the fir first that I just shared with you is that early Acts, what you know from Peter's answer is that this is a renewed opportunity for the nation of Israel still, that God has not cut them off. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that God the Father has not held that, the crucifixion of Christ against them and is giving them another opportunity in early Acts to receive Jesus Christ and to be a part of his kingdom. The second thing that you know is that Peter's preaching the same message of John, that is, it's called the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, when it says in, in Mark, what I was trying to point out to you there, Mark chapter 1, verse 4, it says, John baptized in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance. John preached baptism. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, is preaching baptism for remission of sins, just like John did. Remission actually means for pardon, so your sins won't be held against you. Deliverance. I mean, they've sinned. You want delivered from that sin? Repent and be baptized. It's called the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. If you repent and got baptized, you'd be pardoned of that sin. You'd be delivered from that sin. It, 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 we use the word sometimes for remission as forgiveness. You'd be forgiven of that sin. Deliver, liber, uh, liberty. You'd be set at liberty from that sin. It doesn't say repent and be baptized for the payment of your sin. The payment of your sin is the work of the cross. Now we know that because we know how Christ died for our sins. But while we know that, Peter doesn't know that yet. There's no indication. John the Baptist, when he began to preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, John the Baptist had no idea Jesus Christ was going to a cross. When John was in prison, he hears about Christ's rejection, and he actually sent disciples to go ask the Lord... Is it you that we look for, or do we look for someone else? Because if you're preaching the kingdom is at hand, you're expecting him to come in and wipe out the enemy and sit on the throne, right? But he's being rejected. 
And it looks like he's losing the battle. So John is questioning, are you the one we look for? Do we look for someone else? And the Lord sent the disciples back and say, tell him you see what the healing I'm doing. Because if he's doing the healing, then he's the one you look for, not anybody else. See, what John didn't know, he didn't know the difference between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Matthew chapter 16, after Jesus Christ sends the twelve out in Matthew chapter 10 to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the nation of Israel... That's Matthew 10. Matthew 16, it says that he began to tell his disciples how when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified, uh, turned over to the Gentiles, raised the third day. And Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this will never happen to you. And the Lord had to say, get behind me, Satan, (laughs) to Peter. Because Peter had no idea that when Jesus Christ got to Jerusalem, he was going to be crucified. And even when the Lord told him, he didn't understand it and told the Lord he was wrong. Why? Because they didn't understand the suffering of the Messiah. They saw when he got to Jerusalem, he's going to sit on the throne of David. That's why he was here. They're preaching the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Even after he rose from the dead, and in early Acts there, he spent those 40 days with them. What he spent in those 40 days, showing them in the scripture how he had to suffer the first time, and that now he can reign when he comes back the second time. Now, with that information now, Peter is offering Israel another opportunity to repent. But Peter is still not preaching the cross. There's a verse that you just just write down, uh, just for your own comparison. You could either take Mark 1.4 that we just looked at. There's another one in Acts 13.24. And compare that with what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23 or 1 Corinthians 1.18, both of those verses. Because Paul says that he preached Christ and him crucified. Paul says, if the preaching, uh, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, but to us which are belie- the, that believe, it's the power of God unto salvation. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. Paul preached the cross. Did Peter preach the cross in Acts 2, 38? No, he preached the baptism of repentance, just like John did. They're preaching about baptism for, of repentance for remission of sins. They don't, they're not preaching the cross as the answer for sin. Now, they're not preaching the baptism is what pays for your sin. They're not preaching that. But that is the thing that God told Israel to do and that he would forgive their sins. Later, they'll realize that their sins are going to be able to be forgiven through the cross. But at this point in the book of Acts, the cross isn't the message. The, the gospel being preached is the gospel of the kingdom. And it's being preached to the nation of Israel, and it's still the baptism of repentance for the nation of Israel. When God sent the Apostle Paul out to us Gentiles, we couldn't repent to begin with. In the sense that Israel was under covenant relationship with God, and they'd gotten out of the way, and they needed to come back. Us Gentiles were cut off from God as unclean dogs. The message to us isn't, turn back to God and he'll turn to you. The message to us is that you're a sinner, but Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you'll trust what Jesus Christ did on the cross, God will give you a gift of eternal life because this is the dispensation of his grace. And so for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul went out and preached the work of the cross in our behalf to save us from our sins. So it's important for you to see why Israel's asking that and why Peter answered, what Peter doesn't understand yet. And the message here is still the message about the kingdom. It's still a renewed opportunity for Israel to repent. Now go back to Acts chapter 2. Now that's just the beginning uh, of, of what you need to see real close. There is... See, if you rightly divide the word of truth, you realize it's not until... In fact, I'll show you this, just so you know this. Hold your place in Acts 2, and then come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In, In verse 7. It says... But we, Paul's again writing to the Corinthians, and it's back in chapter 1, verse 18, he talks about the preaching of the cross. Chapter 123 is we preach Christ crucified. Chapter 2 of of 1 Corinthians, verse 7 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now, not mysterious in the sense that you'll never understand what I'm saying. 
It's something that was kept secret. That's what a mystery is, something secret, but it's not a secret anymore because he's speaking it. The secret has been revealed. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now try to figure out what, what is the wisdom he's talking about. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have, what? Crucified the Lord of glory. So the wisdom that he's talking about is the wisdom of the crucifixion of Christ, right? See, Peter knows in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that Christ had to suffer. He knew the scripture said that the Messiah would suffer first and second would reign on the throne of his glory. But he doesn't know the wisdom of the cross yet. Paul says that we've made known the wisdom, hidden wisdom that no one knew. Had this hidden wisdom been known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Because when it says the princes of this world, the princes of this world are being ruled by the prince of this world, Satan himself. And the crucifixion of Christ became the means by which God could save all of mankind freely by his grace. Had that been truth that everybody knew, you think Satan would have had the mob say, crucify Christ and uh, and release Barabbas? Or would you say, kill Barabbas and release Jesus Christ so he can't become the Savior of the world? If Satan knew what Christ was accomplishing on that cross, he thought he was preventing Christ from sitting on the throne of David. He didn't know he was assisting God (laughs) in bringing salvation to the Gentiles, even apart from the nation of Israel. See, Paul preached the wisdom that God had in the cross that was kept a secret. So Paul preaches the cross. Peter doesn't have that wisdom back there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. But he does have the answer to Israel who had rejected Christ and now they have another opportunity to be saved. So back in Acts chapter 2, Peter says in verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Now notice this phrase again. Every one of you. Now, is that you? See, absolutely not. When you understand the context, and John the Baptist never preached to Gentiles. Jesus Christ came to earth and he said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he sent the apostles out, eventually in the future the apostles will go to Gentiles, but not at this point. Peter, as you're going through this verse, he says over in verse 14, Acts chapter 2 verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said, Ye men of Judea, and ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Verse 22 he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Verse 26, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly. So when he says in verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's given them a chance to become part of that believing remnant. And the every one of you is, is God is calling out from within the nation of Israel a believing remnant. And the every one of you is, is, is all the Jews that are there at Jerusalem. And he's calling out those within the nation of Israel who will believe the truth and be part of that group within Israel that God is going to bless and get away from that part of the group in Israel that God's going to burn with the unquenchable fire. There, it's another opportunity. Every one of you, the nation of Israel. Matthew 22 verse 14 says, Many are called, but few are chosen. God's calling out the believing remnant. So the many are called. He's calling out of Israel, but he chooses to have as his people the believing remnant. And what they're called on is to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now what it says there, uh, I'll end with this. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, we're going to pick up here next week because this is extremely important. But just just to, so that your mind thinks about it through the week, there's a whole bunch of detail that we've got to look at on that. But when he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, when you say in the name of, that, you know, that, we say that all the time. If you hear me pray, we ask this in your name, or in your son, not your name, and we ask this in Christ's name. We're praying to the Father, but we're praying in Christ's name. What does it mean to, in his name? Well, in his name means in association with, in identification with him. Sometimes it actually means in his place. 
if, as if he's gone, we'll do something in his name, we'll do it in his place. Or, but sometimes the apostles do it in his name, it's under his authority, by his authority. But when it says this to the nation of Israel, remember, they're the ones, they've rejected God the Son. Now they need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in identification, in association with him. Rather than being a rejecter of Christ, now they're going to become identified with Christ in this water baptism as the believing remnant of Israel who identifies with Jesus Christ as their rightful king. And they'll be forgiven. The part of that nation that is not identified with Christ will not be forgiven. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. The believing remnant will then be also given the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now we'll go back to that because there's a real important part to that that you need to think about and, uh, and learn. So we'll pick up there next week. I thought of trying to move faster through the book of Acts, but I didn't think very long. <laughs> no, I actually thought about it a lot. But e- even if I can, I don't know if I can. I, I get so caught up in, in the details because every detail is important. And, uh, but that verse is an extremely important verse for you to understand. You know, when I went to Bible college, they preached salvation by grace through faith alone. They didn't teach right division. They didn't teach Paul had a different message than the 12 apostles. They didn't teach me that Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles and that the 12 apostles were to the nation of Israel. So we come across that verse and we'd ask the professor, what is that? That verse says, repent and be baptized for the, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And they would tell me all the time, they'd say, well, that doesn't mean repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That means repent and be baptized because your sins are already forgiven you. And because you're already saved, you ought to get water baptized. Yeah, ice is the Greek word, the word for. They say the Greek word is ice, and sometimes that can mean because of. And Peter is saying, because your sins are already forgiven you and you're already saved, you ought to get water baptized. But you know, when you read the Bible, you'd scratch your head saying, you know, you're saying that's what it says, but it says do this for the remission of sins. And, uh, and they actually are twisting the scripture as if Peter understands that sins are already forgiven, that Jesus Christ already died on the cross. Peter doesn't even understand any of that information yet. And if Peter did, did John the, Peter, isn't Peter preaching the same message of John the Baptist? Did John the Baptist tell the nation of Israel their sins were already forgiven and they should get water baptized? He didn't even, Christ didn't die yet during John's ministry. That can't mean that. That's people twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. Well, if, if, you don't, if you don't know that, you'll either learn to twist the scriptures so you can defend grace, or you might be like the Church of Christ and throw away grace and say salvation is by works through repentance and water baptism and enduring to the end. So the, you're, I'm saying all this to realize you, we have to understand that verse properly so that you can be strengthened and built up. As Leon said, we thank the Lord that through right division we can be that. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we... Thank you for the class. I thank you for the scriptures that uh, make it all clear what your requirements were to the nation of Israel. And as we get into baptism of repentance, we'll understand exactly why Israel was required to do that. And we thank you that we realize that our message came later by our apostle, which was given the wisdom of the cross. And we thank you, Lord, that we can understand how you can save us today and why it is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ alone that we can be saved, and why it is that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's your gift, and not of our works. So, Father, help us to come back again and to grow to a point not only so we understand and are assured of our salvation, but help us to show others what they're missing when they study the Scriptures, not for our glory, but for, for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.